Okay, now, okay, it says we're live, but it usually takes about four <coughs> or five seconds, so uh, let's just see where we are with it. Let me just check there. Okay, so I believe we're live, and welcome everybody, and if you have any questions that you'd like to ask, please feel free to um you know, put them down there in the comment section and maybe we'll get to look at those and maybe answer those. Uh, today we're going to talk about the, well, uh, kind of a few things today, mostly the triangle midfield, the different variations of how that can work and how you can set that up and the different formations that it can be put in. Uh, we're going to talk specifically how it works in the 4-3-3 um, and maybe, I don't know, maybe one or two other things will pop up. I've got Rob Paulden with me today and Mike Smith with me again. So, uh, Rob, if you can just do a short uh, bio for so that everybody knows who you are. Uh, well, um, uh, that's uh, uh, yeah. I don't. I wouldn't know where to begin. I'm terrible at kind of um, kind of talking about myself. But uh, I coach college. I'm also um, I, I coach at uh, Fresno Pacific University which is an NCAA Division II program in Fresno, California. I'm also a girls director for Clovis Crossfire, which is uh, the largest club in uh, the Central Valley, uh, which basically runs from about Bakersfield up to uh, uh, through Modesto. <coughs> um, I've been coaching for 34 years uh, in the college game. I've been coaching uh, 22 years, I believe, um, head coach for uh, 17, 18 years, and um, – so I've, uh, you know, this uh, wonderful game has taken me to different places. I've had the chance to uh, travel to Holland to work with Ajax, uh, work with uh, Vitessa. I've gone to Brazil with uh, with Mike and world class coaching, and worked with um, Club Atlético Mineiro. Um, I've been to Italy with uh, Fiorentina. Um, so it's uh, it's been a wonderful journey. Learned uh, learned a lot along the way, and hopefully, I got a lot more to learn. And Mike. Well, yeah, much the same. Mike Smith, I've been uh, coaching youth soccer for 26 years, uh, exclusively at the high school and club levels for 20 years. Um, got my USF D license, um, National Federation of High Schools, Kentucky High School Athletic Association uh, certifications, currently with uh, Todd County Central High School in uh, Western Kentucky. Okay. All right. Well, let's start with the triangle midfield, guys. Let's uh, let's have a look and let's. What are the formations, Rob, that the triangle midfield is typically played in? Well, the the most popular one, obviously, is the four three three, and the advantage because uh, it was created in uh, <coughs> late sixties, early seventies by Renus Mikkels, a uh, famous uh, Dutch coach, uh, who was studying the English game because the English were uh, had come out with a four four two that dominated the world in the 66 World Cup. And so uh, Renus was looking for something to kind of uh, balance that. Plus he had a, uh, what he felt was the best player in the world. And he was very creative and a very fluid player and uh, Johan Cruyff. And uh, he wanted to have him in a central location at all times. But it was uh, a concept of what was called total football, where players and positions shifted, rotated, and moved. The English system uh, with the 4-4-2 he viewed as being a, a more of a rigid system. And so with the, uh, the four, three, three, he felt that kind of gave, uh, more of a, uh, more of a balanced, uh, uh, approach. Uh, the advantage of course, is that when you're, uh, when you're attacking, you've got three forwards up top against usually four defenders. So it's creating two one V one situations. Um, you've got, uh, three central midfielders that are playing, depending on who you're playing against, uh, two of their midfielders or three of their midfielders. So then it comes down to in possession, uh, how you rotate and uh, move that triangle. Uh, you've got um, your outside backs that shift up to become uh, outside mids kind of ball side. So that takes away any kind of an advantage with, uh, with their outside midfield players. And you've got four in the back to kind of balance uh, where they kind of shift and rotate. I call it kind of a shifting back four defense. Uh, a lot of coaches will kind of view it as a check mark. Um, where it'll kind of start with the wing back, center back supporting another center back, and then it goes up. So it resembles a check mark. I kind of also call it a cradle defense because it kind of shifts and rocks and rotates. 
<clears throat> to kind of balance out and everything is kind of in a position to support um, the uh, two attacking mids in the, uh, in the triangle are also known as shadow strikers because they shadow that central striker. And so wherever that central striker goes, they adjust uh, to what they're doing. Uh, and ball side is going to be if you've got two attacking uh, mids, which is kind of how I play and I believe Mike, um, same thing. You've got the uh, ball side attacking mid plays directly underneath that number nine, that center forward, uh, to kind of give them an immediate support because they're usually playing with their back to goal in a lot of cases and they need that immediate support to kind of break that pressure, then your weak side attacking mid is going to shift up, kind of creating a triangle between that number nine and uh, the supporting attacking mid. They shift up in a position where uh, they can attack uh, towards the goal if needed, um, but then it gives you that balance where you've always got that central attacker. Um, so if the nine sh uh, shifts out, your weak side kind of shadow striker, if you will, kind of pushes into that open space to kind of uh, uh, be available to kind of uh, exploit and attack the goal if needed. Uh, it forces their defense to spread out more, be more responsible for positions. Uh, what's very good is it also breaks down the opposing uh, midfield because they're more concerned about how you play. And that's something I always kind of tell my teams. It's how we play, not who we play. So it yep. draws their midfield back, which now forces them into a game where they're just basically just knocking it out, uh, just banging it out, and then you just collect, possess, find options uh, in possession and kind of move forward from there. So uh, triangle midfield is, is um, you know, started kind of in the uh, early 70s with, um, <clears throat> with a very good, uh, uh, you know, very good balance at, at negating the two central midfielders that England had. Uh, from that, you had um, Argentina study uh, what was going on with uh, with the Dutch with their triangle midfield, and that's where the three five two kind of came uh, came about. That's where it was born. Uh, and you had a, a player like Diego Maradona, uh, who all of a sudden <clears throat> became that that focal player. And uh, they were very successful in their three five two, uh, kind of moving forward and attacking. And and then you've seen some hybrids. Obviously, you've got a you know the most famous coach in college soccer in the uh, United States is um, uh, Anson Dorrance, who I think has only won 22 national titles. Um, for some people, 22 years in college soccer is a career and they never win a national title and they're happy if they win a couple conference titles. He's won 20, I think 21 or 22 national titles and um, has a ridiculous win percentage of somewhere around like 89%. Um, I, I couldn't fathom winning 89% of my games. I would love to. I, I believe you could win every game, but um, he's he's kind of set the tone that'll never ever be achieved again. And he plays a three four three, um, ba balances that with a four three three, and uh, also lately in the last few years, uh, five or six years, he's actually implemented a four two three one, which is something we've seen a lot from Spain probably in the last dozen years. Certainly the strong teams that uh, Spain have had were in, when they had the run to winning the World Cup, they, they played a lot of their, um, a, a lot of what they were doing uh, and their success was in a 4-2-3-1, which is just an easy way of saying, hey, let's take our 7 and 11, our wing attackers, and let's just slide them back into the midfield a little bit, play in and, and, and balance out. But the whole thing, again, is keyed off of that triangle midfield again and uh, the strength that that offers. So it's, uh, it's no secret that most of the, uh, the formations that dominate in the, in the game today, the modern game even, are based on that triangle midfield that was created back in the uh, late 60s, early 70s by Renus Nichols. And Mike, you play a 4-3-3, and you're, you, you, play, you said you play with the pivot, uh, revert, like the reverse triangle with the uh, – one holding midfielder and two attacking midfielders. Talk about that a little bit. Well, thanks for being such a tough act to follow there, Rob. That, that was a history <laughs> lesson, man. That takes, takes me back to middle school, my first real coach. Hey, I, I don't want to say I'm that old, okay? Well, I'm not taking I mean, you back to middle game, school. Look, <laughs> yeah, game look, game within a game, uh, total football. I just that, That's bringing back memories. Uh, what I, what, the reason I do it, everything Rob said, I agree with absolutely. Um, but I don't always have the players. Uh, I've coached four different high schools in Kentucky and, and three of them 
have been in the smallest 120 in the state. And so I don't always have the players to just force it right up the middle. I'm a firm believer uh, the penalty spot's the best place to score on the field. That's why they put it there. So ideally, that's where you want your shots to come from. But I don't always have the people to play. And I've found that that triangle midfield, uh, the way you're holding it, and, and either way is fine. But, yes, I like to step up the left and the right mid. It's always going to give me an open guy on the outside to send a cross in. And I can always do that. And so that's the, the big advantage when, you know, they've got a choice. Are they going to go out that wide and mark my wide people? Whether that's one of my forwards, whether that's one of my outside backs, that triangle of three, like Rob said, it dictates to the other team. It, it creates a disadvantage, especially if they're playing like a 4-4-2, where, where, again, you like to hold that one guy wide and maybe the other guy a, a little wider. So you've really only got two there in the middle. And uh, it always gives me an open player in the middle if they adjust from that, which they're going to. It gives me an open player on the outside to, to send some crosses in. And uh, I don't think any other uh, shape really does that as well as the triangle midfield. Okay. Well, when I played three in the middle, which wasn't I, – I mostly played two in the middle, but that was because of the players I had, I guess uh, – but I, there were seasons where I, I played three, uh, you know, I played a three-five-two for a whole season um, with, with one team. And when I played, uh, I used to depend on how the game was going, would depend on how I would set it up. My first choice was to be have a, a holding <laughs> midfielder and then the two more attacking midfielders. Um, right. But if we were up against a team that was stronger than us and was, you know, having more of the possession than we were, then I would revert that, and I'd have uh, mm -hmm. two holding midfielders and uh, an attacking, uh, and just one attacking midfielder. So it all depended on how the game was going. But the first choice was always with one holding midfielder because I felt that gave us, uh, you know, more attacking opportunities. Right. So what? Now Mike says he plays that way. Rob, you say you play that way with a one pivot back. Is that the most common way that the triangle midfield is played, or is it? even or do other people play the, the with two holding midfielders? How does that go? Well, I originally started um, uh, when uh, learning the system kind of in depth when, when I was um, working with Ajax and um, uh, you know, coaches like Vim Serbier and uh, Barry Holshoff and uh, uh, had the privilege of uh, Dennis DeBoer a little bit as well. Um, and so uh, looking you know, that's where I kind of learned it. And, and they first, uh, their, the, the way it was introduced to me was one attacking, two holding, uh, where your, your number 10 was your attacking mid and it was keyed off of what the nine did. So if the nine checked to the ball, the, the attacking mid kind of supported weak side. So it was at an angle behind. Uh, and then the other two filled in so that your holding mid supported underneath, uh, ball side supported underneath and the other one kept the shape of the triangle. So it was, um, <clears throat> two holding one attacking uh the more i kind of worked with um uh those coaches uh started to learn about the uh the flexibilities and the um uh the variances within the triangle um when i went to vitessa and started working with um, um peter Wiestra, uh who coached um uh, you know he was the reserve team coach at the time i know he's he's coaches in the air divisie now uh and then you also had um uh, the co coach back then was um, uh, uh, Ad Damas, uh, and so uh, everything was based on that structure uh, following that, but they, they went more to two attacking, one holding um, with their youth teams and um, kind of learned that. And um, as far as really what the, the change was, is it wasn't so much that you had the, the two the two holding one attacking and you flipped it so you went two attacking one holding it was the triangle was was um this is a concept that they kind of taught me it's a living breathing thing um the uh the triangle it, it expands in possession it contracts when it's defending so it breathes it expands it contracts just just like when you breathe your your chest expands and contracts and um understanding that it's not a rigid one attacking two holding or two attacking one holding that it's constantly rotating and spinning um, and constantly moving having three dynamic players that can play as a holding at any given time as an attacking at any given time is kind of a you know an important part of the equation 
um, when I came back and started to kind of implement a lot of that myself, which was probably early 2000s, um, uh, I found a lot of success with it. And I was originally playing with one attacking, two holding, because that's where kind of my initial learning was. And, and the more I started stretching out of that, then I started going to the two attacking, realized I enjoyed that. Um, but I started to realize going through it that it's really doesn't matter much because of the fact that the, sh the rotating and the shifting, it does come down to a little bit of a, a positional issue when it comes to defending uh, as far as positioning where they are. Um, and then uh, an assistant who was with me, uh, who's actually now the, uh, he went to be the associate head coach at Young Harris uh, on the men's side there, Dean Gray. Um, he, um, he was calling me and talking with me about, hey, we play the 4-3-3 here too, but we actually change it a bit. We play one attacking, one holding, and then there's a, a kind of a, a floating player that plays in the middle that shifts to the ball side always. So they're, you know, when the ball's on the left, they're shifting left. When the ball's on the right, they're shifting right. And you've got the other two that are kind of playing in the in-between and uh, keeping the shape of the triangle. Uh, but they designate one attacking, one holding always, and then the other one is kind of that floating player that is able to move and manipulate. And what they found was because they had a player that had such freedom and movement that way, um, the other team had no idea how to counter it. Mark, do you mark that player? But then you've got an attacking that you got to deal with as well. You got the holding, so it's almost like that false nine concept that the four two three one creates yeah. in that yeah. respect. Yeah, you mentioned that before we got online, Rob, and I actually. I love that. I know Mike loves it as well. So, Mike, what, yeah. what, do you, what do you think about that, where you've got an attacking midfielder, a defensive midfielder, and the one in between moves side to side depending on where the ball is? Well, and, and I, I, love, I love that. Actually, um, to kind of piggyback on what, what Rob was saying, I used – I did the same thing. I started with my number 10 up, combining with the number 9, the two holding ones. But what I discovered was, in my system – the goal was to create some type of a lane as you get the defense to shift to your possession and the holding mids were in the best position to exploit that. So I had them running up and I think we were talking before we went live, you end up with two of them up there, maybe all three of them up there. And so in allowing them to do that, I started realizing, why don't I just designate, like Mike said, designate one to hold and give those the freedom to go, to go up. There's a whole different element there uh, if you give them that freedom to go lateral because a lot of times the one that's keeping the shape of the triangle uh, on the off ball side is not really doing much. And if they just went over on the on the ball side, that's numbers up there. That's something they could create and they would still keep the shape. So I'm I've never even thought of that, but my wheels are turning right now. I'm, I'm going to try it. The, the the only issue that I would have with that, and I, I was talking about this before, was, you know, when you've got younger players, um, yeah. you know, you they don't hand, they sometimes don't handle that responsibility well. So, um, you know, you could end it, you could end up with it, it, like if I played with, uh, like I said, I I sometimes played with two midfield. <laughs> And it would be if, if one went up, then the other one automatically filled that space behind. Right. If one went up, then this one would fill the space in behind mm -hmm. and become the midfield. But what would tend to happen is they wouldn't take that responsibility. One would be pushing up involved and the other one would go up as well and we'd end up with a big hole at the back ready to get exploited. And my thought is my, if I did that and nominated an attacking midfielder, a, a defensive one and one that swung around in the middle, the attacking midfielder might just end up being another center forward and, yeah. and not really think that they had any responsibilities defending. But um, do you see any weaknesses with that? Or do you, I, well, let's look at that. We, we all, we all love that. The idea of that system. We've just heard it, Rob. Is, is there any possible weak? <laughs> That. Well, I think when when um, I, I think back to the uh, to a team I had at um, Southwest Baptist University when when I was uh, when I was coaching there back um, oh six seven years ago, um, I had a a player that um, she she was good at attacking. She was a dangerous player. Great touch, great vision of the game, very involved. Uh, work rate off the ball, not so much. 
uh, especially on the defending side. She was about six one, um, is six two in height. So I mean, she she was she was a, a player that just stood out, and because of her touch and her ability, um, and she was dangerous from the outside, she was very effective. Um, and we played with one one holding and, and two attacking, and and this is before I kind of started to kind of uh, you know learn about that player that floated and and but I and actually what spot did she pl- what spot did she play? She was uh she was playing as a number ten, so it's an uh, attacking mid, one of the attacking mid. striker one of the yeah. attacking mids okay and so the other attacking mid because uh, I had these two twin sisters that played for me. Um, one played. Uh, one of the sisters played as a number nine. The other one was the other attacking mid. She played as the eight. Um, but because she was the other attacking mid, she pretty much was the one that was floating on the in-between. And um, so she had to kind of um, compensate for the other player that, that you know, wasn't really as hard a worker off the ball when it came to defending side. So the other one was allowed to kind of stay up a little bit higher and adjust. Um while she kind of did the work um, running. And so, you know, if I equated it, you know, the, the, uh, the one player would probably put in five and a half, six miles a game. And, and the, uh, the taller player put in maybe three and a half, four miles. And so she was constantly moving and running, but she had the fitness to do it. And she ended up being, you know, all three of those players, the two twin sisters and the kid that was six, one, six, two, all of them ended up being all Americans um, by the time they got to their senior year. And so, uh, even though she had the, um, you know, the, the, the flaw in her game that she was, um, you know, the, a lot of coaches might say lazy. Um, she wasn't, she didn't work as hard defensively off the ball, drove me crazy as a coach. Um, but it was, it was one of those things. She was just so dangerous in the attacking side with what she could do with the ball that you allowed her to be that attacking player up top. And, and that other player kind of did the rotation underneath. Um so when my assistant coach went to Young Harris and he started working there, that was my immediate thought uh, because it, it allows an attacking player to focus on the attacking side. They can still defend up there uh, on that high, that, that attacking third, but then you still got that holding mid protecting the middle. And that's always what I found to be kind of the, um, the, um, the, the underbelly of the system. If, um, if you get a team that gets, that gets two players or, or gets a player in there, that's, that's quick that can exploit that, that holding mid in that position. If they draw them out, that'll open up the center. And that's where, that's where you end up with, uh, with problems because then you get a lot of chances against you in that 20 to 30 yard range, uh, which can kind of be dangerous. Right. Okay. And so Mike, let me just, do you see any weaknesses just, and I know we've just come across this pretty quickly. Uh, so this it's just a first glance to see any weaknesses with having, uh, one up, one back, and a, a swinger in the middle. Well, well, two. Uh, the the main thing, you know, I, I'm a firm believer. A turnover in the midfield is is the most costly thing. I, you know, usually if you even turn it over and you're in, you've usually got numbers back, you've got compactness, you've got some depth. So it's not to me as dangerous as that turnover there. So when you're getting that aggressive and losing your balance, that's what I think would be the thing. I think you could easily lose your, your balance and there's going to be a hole there. And and then like Rob said, somebody could exploit that real quick. I just, I, I hate those. You turn the ball over and your only option, if your only option is for a defender to, to come up and try to get the ball in a panic in the midfield, which has created a hole, of course, in your back line and, and youth sports high school level, that's what's going to happen. Uh, if, if I'm running, you know, if you could end up with all three of your midfielders on one side, no balance, one turnover in the middle, here, here comes one of my center yeah. forwards, yeah. you know, two two good guys could combine and really exploit that. So just looking at it now, that's what I think the loss of balance and getting overly aggressive in the midfield might be an issue. So, Rob, I asked you this question. I don't know if you answered it. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> you're going on about you. Mate, you answered a lot of other things, but so the most, the the most people, let's say, with a four three three, or whether they play with a triangle midfield. Do you think most people play with a defensive midfielder and two attacking ones, or two holding midfielders and one attacking one? I think it depends. Uh, at, at my level, uh, at the college game, um, 
you see you see a lot of balance. I think it's more common you're going to see two attacking, one holding, at our level. Okay. Um, but you know you've got a lot of coaches that are pretty sharp. That if they see if they see like my team is strong as far as with two attacking, uh, and and they do well at combining with the nine, then uh, there are coaches that will adjust and go to two holding to try and negate our two attacking mids uh, in that respect. And then you see a lot of teams that'll just they'll just try to match up man to man, and then it comes down to our players uh, when that happens working on rotating so that the marking player is always trailing and we can always find feet when we play. Okay. Well, let's, let's talk about that because all three of us play, uh, all three of us play with the same uh, situation where we have a holding midfielder and uh, two attacking midfielders. Now let's talk about that holding midfielder. Here's the top search Excuse me. <laughs> Just give me a second here. Um, so when I look at my holding midfielder, I I didn't look at her defensive qualities. In fact, she wasn't that good of a defender. I She was a good holding midfielder for me because she was a really good passer of the ball. So she could get yeah, the yep. ball and she could lay passes off, you know, uh, out to my wide players pretty good. And she could, you know, she could see things. So she was a good passer of the ball. Um, and that's what I like in my holding midfielders. Uh, so what are, what traits do you look for, Mike, with, with your, when you've got your players as a holding midfielder? Very, very much the, the same. I, I don't necessarily want them to be a good um, defender. I mean, it's great if they are. But I want them to be able to disrupt, to be a good disruptor, high level of fitness when they get the ball absolutely uh, a great distributor of the ball because in the way I play it, that's the goal of it is to hit that outside target that we've created. Uh, definitely want them, um, and this is all three of them, but definitely the holding mid, having that positional awareness, knowing they're going to have that positional discipline, and then probably as a final plus, if they've got a great shot from, you know, top of the box to 30 out, that's – that's going to be a bonus because that's about as far as I'm going to let them creep up. Um, well, it's yeah. My the the girl that I'm thinking of was uh, for, for me was she wasn't a good. She, well, I wouldn't say she was a bad defender. She just you wouldn't class her as though she, you know she's a good defender. But she right. positional wise and awareness wise, she knew how to fill that space. So just by filling that space. You know, she would intercept, uh, uh, you know, stuff that was played through there. She would stop the other team even trying to go through there because she was filling that space. <laughs> and when she got the ball, she'd get the ball at her feet and she'd be able to just pass and pass and pass. And yep. that would then get us going on that. So, yep. Rob, do you, do you look for anything different? Um. I'll, I'll kind of be the, um, the, uh, the, the black sheep of the conversation. Um, um, I, I always, uh, I, I look for a player that, um, as, as I always say, the holding mid for me is the quarterback of the uh, system. Um, they have to have a good voice. Uh, they have to be strong communicators because they are responsible for keeping the shape of the triangle. And so right. they've got to make sure the attackings are, are where they're supposed to be. Uh, the weak side shifts up, the ball side's underneath, so they're not getting out of shape and they position to kind of keep track. So they're, they're very much uh, that communicating force back there. That's what I look for in a, in a holding. I need somebody that is a strong ball winner in the air. Um, yeah. because a lot of times when we're putting our opponent under so much stress, so much pressure, they can't connect, uh, to get out their passes. They're just going to bang it. And when they start banging it long, it's, it's, uh, 90% of the time that ball's coming up in the air in the middle. And I need somebody that can step in and, and challenge and win that ball in the air. And because uh, I want that ball going back the other way. So um, I need a player that's a strong ball winner there. Uh, I, I look for somebody that's not afraid to be physical uh, because a lot of times when they are going for the ball in the air, they're going to have a, uh, their, one of their center forwards uh, that's, or one of their forwards looking to try and win that ball to receive and, and hold on to it to relieve pressure. Um, so they're usually coming back from the central defenders to, to try and win it. And that's where I want that holding mid to be able to, to win those physical confrontations and, and battle. Uh, and they're also, um, they, their, their nickname is the linking player. They link the defense 
to the uh, to the attack with the attacking mids and the uh, the wing attackers in the center forward. <clears throat> so I need a player that can connect passes uh, from left to right, from from back to front, uh, one two touch. Um, they're not going to be glamorous players, not your dynamic creative players. Uh, they're the player that's I always uh, equate as being a blue collar in the trenches kind of kid. Um, you know, and it's, um, you know, when, when I look at the women's game, um, you know, the, probably the, not probably the, the, the best holding mid the women's game has ever seen was Michelle Akers. You know, she, she started as an attacking mid later in her career. Like when they won the 99 world cup, she was in that, that holding mid position and dominated everything, shut down soon when, so she shut down their main attacker. Uh, so it had to be a very strong physical player. And Michelle was. Um, and when the ball was in the air, there was nobody who was going to win it other than Michelle. Um, uh, you know, when you got a five, 10, six foot force coming at you in the air, especially with the curls probably made her more like six, three, six, four. Um, and, um, she would dominate everything in the air. Nobody would win the ball against her. Um, right. she was it's, dangerous it's, from, it's, from 30, 40, even as far as a shot. It's, it's yeah. interesting you say that because you what you look for in a player is is almost yeah. you know as your first choice is almost the opposite of what i uh, not what i look for but my the player that i'm thinking of on my national championship team she my, my player was a creative player yeah you know she uh, and i didn't need her to head the but she was she was short so she wasn't a great header of the ball but i had center defenders to do that Mm -hmm. um and to me what i what i wanted her to do was get the ball and distribute it and get it going uh, and so <laughs> creativity was important for me for, for for that position now the other two midfielders that played above you know they were also creative and good and that's why they were you know center midfielders uh but i i didn't really need to me having more creative creativity there then defensive abilities um w that to me was more important and uh, you were you the same mike on that <laughs> well i was going to say if i had a chance to interject he's describing my perfect center back uh e e that's exactly i'm i think i'm with you because um, yeah. i i want them i want them feeling um like they can get involved in in the attack more than because I'm using my outside backs to cover. When I step a center back up, hopefully one's dropping and the other two outside are tucking in. And for me, that was fine. So I was okay with having one of the center backs be that aggressive ball winner, physical player in the air. And then perhaps looking to combine with my my holding mid, it gives them that outlet right there. So, um, Well, and, and that's kind of how I thought about it. I thought about it as uh, my – and the, th the thing with me, with my team that I'm talking about, I had two of the most incredible center backs you've ever seen. I never saw anybody better than those two in, you know, all the years that we played with that team. They were just incredible. Um, so that made it easier, I guess, that I could have a, you know, I, the, the, my defensive mid, I could just put my cre creative player in there. But the whole point, the, the, the two, the, the main factors that I had for that player was, fill that space so there's about you know as we're attacking or as they come in there's usually a gap you know 10 15 yards from all the action you you're back there <laughs> filling that space so that if they've got runners you can pick them up if they play the ball through you can pick them up but right. other than that my criteria was all based on okay if we have the ball that is what i you know here is what I want. So it, right. the, although they were a defensive mid, their kind of responsibilities were, you know, 80% attacking when we have the ball uh, and just 20% fill that space. And, you know, right. don't worry if you can't get it because these two girls behind you are going to clear it up. But, <laughs> exactly uh, right. Rob, you kind of went the, you kind of went the other way and, and more, uh, you know, more defensive, uh, qualities i guess well i kind of look at um uh, you know everything in triangles so that holding mid makes a triangle with the two center backs and so um i always like to when we're building out of the back uh and we play the ball to one of the center backs if they've got space to attack and move forward they're going 
And, and I want them to exploit that because then the other team's got to scramble to adjust to a player coming from a withdrawn position, coming right. forward with the ball and, and trying to attract. But what happens then is then uh, the other center back's going to slide underneath to kind of cover. The, the holding mid is going to open and, and draw back behind a bit to allow that center back to kind of um, attack that space and force them to try and adjust. So that holding mid, they're, they're going to be in position sometimes where they are going to be a center back, at least the way I play it. Um, right. So yeah, I, I kind of – occasion, occasionally. Yeah, so I kind of look for those qualities um, where I need that force. I also look at when we uh, – when we're defending as a team – our, our, our first goal, obviously, is to force our opponent to play wide, um, you know, certainly in our third. Uh, we we want to make them predictable as far as how they're going to attack us uh, yeah. so that we defend that and we know how to defend it. And so if they get into that central position kind of in, in front of our defense, so if our defense is in a certain position our, and, and you've got that gap in front of them, if, if that gap exists and they're able to play in front of that gap, that's where the holding mids got to be able to kind of – negate that and shut that down right. so i need somebody who's not afraid to step and be physical uh with them so i need a strong defender and i want my attacking mids although one's going to be back the other one's going to be kind of up supporting the number nine because you don't want to kind of isolate them you want to give them that support uh to for the counter attack uh that holding mid has got to be a strong physical enough player that they can win those challenges when that ball comes into there because then it's going to start getting chaotic with you know 20 25 yards from the field uh, especially if we've kind of dropped all the way because they've attacked the line and we're in there defending. Um, so I kind of look more for that holding in mid to have have a, a, a bit of a, a defensive quality to them, but also because we do shift and rotate the triangle quite a bit, uh, especially in possession, uh, I, I look for them to be a threat as far as being able to, uh, you know, be a force from the outside especially uh, and not be afraid to be, um, you know, be an attack-minded player when it's called on. So, um, you know, there are moments that I will ask a holding mid to step forward in the attack, but I also ask them to choose your moments wisely. Uh, so you pick your moments to go forward, whereas the attacking mids, they're more in a position where even though they defend and, and they keep the shape of the triangle to negate the other team from getting into their middle players, uh, their responsibility is more to support that, that central striker acting as that shadow striker. And those are those creative players. That I look for. It's interesting because my defensive mid was actually the leading scorer out of the th out of the uh, four midfielders that we had. Yeah. She, you know, she was good. She was creative, and she was good. And uh, you know, she would go up in the uh, attack also, and one of the others would have to drop back for her. But uh, yeah, she she was creative in that sense. Let, let's let's look at two different issues here. Let's look at uh, defending. So we've got a triangle midfield, Mike, and you've got one uh, holding midfielder, two attacking midfielders, and you're now in a, a defend defensive situation. How do you uh, deal with those three players in when it's defending? Well, well, hope so. Actually, that's a situation. And, and the last time I was on, we talked about it. You know, those gaps between the back four. I want them covered. So that's actually a situation where I'm going to invert the triangle. And, and ask those those two, my left and right, to come right down in their gaps. Hopefully the defensive midfielder, the holding mid, has stepped up and tried to disrupt the play. And so then you've actually got it looking like this. And that's, you know, that's why I called my guys uh, the left and right. They're box to box. Um, you know, I'm, let, I'm letting them pass that holding mid, but sometimes pass them up coming backwards as well. Uh, and I think that's the, the simplest way. So I inverted. So now we're looking like this. We win the ball back. Hopefully we're getting it wide or up to the, the playmaker. Then they're coming right up to which play, that pass. Go which ahead. player inverts back? Is it, is, it the, is it the one on the ball side? Uh, it, it's, actually, it's actually both, both of them. Now, if they, they, don't, you know, they don't have to just pass the ball to get back in their gap, and that's what I have a lot, a lot of times when I'm teaching this. So, yes, the, the ball side, if, if they lose the ball or the ball's lost, they're going right to put pressure on the ball. Uh, but the, the off ball side is going back in that gap. And, and the holding mid is, is either holding or stepping to support what's happening on the ball side. Then, you know, say the ball is one and comes across, 
that's when that other one would step up that dropped in would step up to to basically steal the switch. I, I do that a lot. Uh, a lot of times, you know, you put pressure on the ball here. I, I don't like to switch out flat through the midfield, but a lot of teams around here do. And if you can run that other midfielder back and hide him between the the two defenders, they can pick off that. It's almost like a, a cornerback in the NFL waiting to intercept the ball. You can see it coming. So I drop that other one right back to, to steal the switch. Right. Okay. And Rob, how do you, when you're defending, do you uh, in, change the triangle round as well? Uh, I, I don't really look at it like two attacking, one holding when we're defending. The, f the first thing, obviously, that we do is um, in less than two seconds or within two seconds, we want to get pressure on the ball. Uh, wherever that comes from, if it's uh, our seven, nine, or 11, one of those three, they get pressure. They look to compact. Uh, if we're in our opponent's half of the field, we're forcing them centrally. Uh, if we're in our half of the field um, or our third of the field, we're keeping them wide so we don't give them central, uh, you know, we don't give them that central option. Um, but the triangle, the first thing is the, the within the triangle, whoever's the closest, I always say we get a tip on the ball. And what I mean by a tip on the ball is wherever the ball is, we're going to get a tip. And that tip is going to be blocking the passing lane to their central midfield players. The other two are keeping the shape of the triangle. They get a bit more compact, but they're very aware of where the other players are because certainly in a, in a system like the 4-2-3-1, they will, uh, I use the term, they ghost. And when I mean, what I mean by they ghost is the, the outside, their holding mids might be playing a bit wider in order to open up space to receive the ball to play around the triangle. So we're aware of that we may adjust and step to mark to mark, uh, mark man to man. Um, but it's, uh, it's very much, we get the shape of the triangle. We get a tip on the ball to block the middle of the passing. Uh, the other two midfielders that are not on the tip are then looking at what the options are, you know, their central options are because that's our purpose is to eliminate their middle options. Um, so for forcing inside in their half, We've got our wing attacker maybe pressing. The nine has kind of shifted over to kind of close the space. They may drop a little bit because we don't want to give them that pass behind the forwards. We want to encourage that ball playing back. Um, and then the uh, the weak side attacking uh, wing attackers shifting in almost centrally uh, to force them in a position where they have to try and just play back and dump it long. Um, and if we eliminate those middle options, then they don't have any way to kind of play through them and play out the weak side. So the triangle midfield, their responsibility, first thing is we get a tip on the ball so that they don't have a direct pass into a middle player. The other two midfielders are picking up options to make sure that they can't just pass to them and kind of play on the fringes of our triangle. Uh, so they may have to mark man-to-man -man or they keep the shape and they, and they allow them to kind of run in and out so they're not getting distracted and they just communicate and make sure they pick up. We get that pressure. The wing back is shifting up so we have that check mark shape. Uh, and then the weak side center back acts as that, uh, that voice uh, for the defense to make sure that we're in a position we're covering their marks. But it's getting that tip on the ball first to eliminate any kind of a central pass into their midfield okay. players, which are their dynamic players as far as what we'll look at. That's, that's exactly what I meant to say right there. That what, the way you said. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so – Basically, it, it, we're all doing the we're all doing the same uh, same thing uh, defending. What what about attacking? So now you you've got possession of the ball. You you know you're the stronger team, so you're constantly attacking. Uh, you've got more of the possession. Um, how do you, Mike? What do you how how do you get your triangle midfield going and playing in that situation? Well, so if, if you've got a strong center forward, they're going to double that up. They're, they just are. So now you've got your, you've got your two other playing in a 4-3-3. The, the choice is, do, do they step a, a defender way out wide to defend that guy? And the answer is no. So you've got three in there. You've got one defender to worry about. I'm stepping those two up. It's almost like a five. So it's a three and then a two. And you've just got those right. two triangles – right there and and they're looking to still distribute make sure we're always using that wide option uh I, I, if we're really in control i let you know the ball comes back in because i'm constantly wanting to make the defense do like this not just go ahead and hit across if we can open up that space so i'm using them to really switch that ball right right around the top of the box 
And if there's a lane combined with the striker, uh, hit the striker, give and go, or if it opens up, you know, when they get a shot, absolutely, absolutely take it. So I'm, I'm basically, and Rob's going to say this much better than me here in a second, but, but basically, you know, I'm looking for that, that two triangle set of five really key position and create a shot that we know is going to go in, not just force something. Right. And Rob, how do you do your triangle midfield when you're in possession and attacking? Well, we um, we start kind of like at, at the basics when we're teaching this. We, we start with teaching them how we want to possess. And so the first thing we always look for is do we have an option to play defeat to our number nine? Um, and, and we do that because we want to keep their two center backs in tight. Uh, typically what happens is when the, when the nine checks, we have them check at an angle, not directly back to the ball. We have them check in an angle, and by checking at an angle, they're, they're going to come one side. That's going to open up the space on the other side where the weak side attacking mid can now start to exploit that space. And so if the nine checks and the weak side attacking is going into that other space, they're at an angle to each other, but they've drawn that center back out. So then there's just one center back acting as a sweeper. And if we work on the combination of playing into the nine to the weak side attacking mid, they're in one, one V one in the middle of the field, 25, 30 yards from goal, um, going to goal. And if that sweeper has overcommitted to the ball side because they're afraid of the number nine, then that weak side attacking mid is actually going to have a chance to go towards goal, even beating that player, depending on the speed of both players or the pace of both players. And even if not, they're going to end up 15, 16 yards with a quality shot in the middle. So we always work on what we call midfield combinations where we work on playing into that first option um, and, and then kind of building from there. But we, we start with how to possess. First option is we look for the number nine. If the number nine's not on, our second option is to play to one of our two attacking midfielders. So we're constantly playing into those central options. Uh, and we do that because we want to keep our seven and 11, our wing attackers, very, very wide. And we keep them very wide because their wing backs then have the choice. Do they go all the way outside to mark those, those wide players? Uh, to eliminate or, or try to uh, eliminate them. And when they do that, they open up acres of space between the center backs and that wing back. Yep. And that's the space we look for our attacking mids to exploit. If they stay inside, then they're giving acres of space for the wing attackers to win the ball at feet and attack them 1v1. And then we work on our runs to goal because at that point, then we know a serve's coming from the outside. Uh, and we're going to be able to exploit that with our runs to go and making sure we're where we're supposed to be. So it, 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 at that point, it, it, as long as we're playing in possession, we play here first, we play here second. Uh, as far as in possession, we teach them how to possess. Okay, so we look here first, we look here second into those central options. Then it comes down to we adjust to what our opponent is doing with our defense. But we focus a lot on that midfield in the positioning. Ball side attacking mid is underneath the nine when they check. Uh, usually 12 to 15 yards. The weak side attacking mid is the one that's shifting up, so they're not level with the with the ball side attacking mid. They're in that they're at an angle in between the nine and the ball side attacking mid at an angle because if the nine overcommits, where where they shift back too far, then the weak side becomes the number nine and they shift all the way up. And then what happens is everybody else has to adjust. Because then your holding mid at that point is going to communicate, okay, I'm going to step. The, the, the player that's 12 to 15 yards is there, there. They're going to drop underneath to become the holding. And then the nine who's shifted into that position actually becomes an attacking mid in that position. And then it's a matter of the combinations. Can we exploit the weak side number, uh, you know, uh, attacking mid that's going through? Um, and you, there, there are somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 odd different combinations when you play into the number nine that involve the two attacking mids and what you can do. Okay. So um, other than a four, four, two, most teams would play with three central midfielders in some shape. When they, yes. mm -hmm. Have you, uh, okay. So have you, so 90% of the time, because uh, I, I would, there's few teams play with a four, four, two these days, but, the majority of time, you're, you've got your three central midfielders battling against uh, the three central midfielders from another team. So it's pretty evenly uh, player for player in, in that respect. Have you ever come across 
a team that's playing with four central midfielders. Like they've got the uh, the Brazilians used to play with that box midfield. Oh. You know, they used to play a, a four-two-two-two. Have you ever come across teams that have played that? Yes, I've seen that. Um, we'll, we'll see that on occasion because they'll try and shut it down. And basically what it comes down to is their their midfield is – all four midfielders are shifting to ball to the ball side. And then it's a matter of can we quickly exploit because if you keep your wing attackers wide, um, then what happens is that weak side um, wing back uh, becomes more of a factor. So if you can quickly shift – uh, your possession, and that's where the linking player comes in. If we can switch to that to that wing back, uh, where we play into the holding mid, into the wing back coming out the other side, we're going to get around that box those midfielders that are committed because they've given up 35, 40 yards of space uh, on the weak side. So if we can if we can find that holding mid and we can shift into that other space, we're going to be able to exploit and get around that. And then it's a matter of finding that central option. So our game. The only way the game changes is we look to be able to shift the ball from from uh, from the right side to the left side, left side to the right side. We look to go quickly um, and then still finding that central option getting in behind because then that'll break down their midfield by uh, by pulling them back into their defense. And so it's a matter of being able to play quickly. The only other way is you have to be able to bypass uh, the pressure of the midfield, which means now you've got to play longer balls, uh, into the forwards, uh, playing back to the supporting defenders or midfielders, and then playing up again. So it's more of an up back through concept uh, in yep. order to kind of break that pressure with their midfield and what they're trying to do. Uh, have you come across somebody playing forward in the middle, Mike? Yeah, and they yeah. Well, and a lot of times what we'll have is they will have almost like two holding mids and yeah. then two attacking mids, and they basically make a triangle by shifting the top two yeah. lateral depending on where the ball is. And, and so okay. like Rob said, I'm just negating that by playing quickly to my outside back, and that's what I want to do anyway. I like to play pretty direct and, and pretty fast. So it, it's not necessarily much of a problem uh, because, you know, unless the, their three and their triangle are better than our three, but I'm always going to step my outside back up into that anyway. So uh, sometimes difficult, definitely, if they're a better team, but not anything that would cause me to change drastically what I'm doing. Yeah, I one of the one of my styles of play or my main style of play was I used to love playing wide. Our the whole objective of our team is you know pass the ball with an objective of getting it to the wide players because we've got great wide players who can take players on, you know, feed the number nine, get crosses in and, and cause trouble that way. So if, if, if I came across somebody playing four in the middle, then they're struggling out wide and that's going right. to leave us tons of space out yep. wide. Yep. And, it, you know, all systems of play, all formations, but it, it doesn't matter what it is. It, it boils down to whether one team can, uh, impose their will on the other team. If yep. you know, if you, if the other team has got great wide players and they keep passing it out wide, then your midfielders are going to start having a drift out wide in there and, and, and deal with that. If they're doing that better than you, if you are, you know, dominating possession in the midfield, then they're going to have to bring their wide players in to to counter that and and affect their shape. So it's somebody. One team or the other has to adapt their shape depending on whether they're they're on the uh, losing end of the battle uh, during that part of the game, I guess. But uh, okay, well, uh, guys, we're almost at an hour, so we better wrap up. Is there anything else that we haven't covered that we think we should uh, cover quickly? No, we could probably spend covered. hours and hours on this topic, um, <laughs> and and so. Um, now, for me, it's it's always about uh, just kind of echoing that. It's just it's how we play, not who we play. That's what I always tell my team. Uh, the other team's going to put 11 players on the field, and I always tell them, you know, I'm pretty sure one will be a goalkeeper. You know, the rest is for you to solve if the game goes on because I don't want to think for them. I want them to think and solve. Uh, and then from there, it's a matter of uh, we focus on our game being perfect in our game, and if we do that, we're going to be successful. Right. Yep, that's kind of, okay. you know – you can do everything you want about formations. It's you. 
you have to instill your formation and your style of play over the other team and force them to change. If they're stronger than you and they're doing better than you, they're going to force you to change. So uh, every system has its strengths and weaknesses based on that. But uh, triangle midfield, guys, thanks uh, so much. And uh, we'll have another one in the next week or two. So we'll definitely, uh, I'll definitely be asking you guys to uh, come on and talk about something else. Um, so thanks again, Mike, and thanks again, Rob, and uh, we'll sign off. All right. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thank you.